I spend around 70% of my time uh, on the shop floor, seeing patients running MDTs, doing ward rounds and clinics and so on. And I spend about 30% of my time in a consolidated hub and spoke laboratory in West London that serves many different hospitals and GP practices. And then I'm fortunate enough to get four hours a week to do a little bit of research. And in that research, uh, along with some key collaborators that you see at the top of the screen here, uh, so Nabila, Rachel, Michael, Gary, Scott, Joseph, and Stephen, we have set up the Chelsea Infectious Diseases Research Group, or the Cinder Group, functioning out of Chelsea Westminster Hospital NHS Foundation Trust. And under the umbrella of the Imperial College Academic Health Sciences uh, Centre, we collaborate closely with our colleagues at Imperial College Healthcare Trust and with North West London Pathology and with various elements of Imperial College London, uh, from, uh, from the infectious diseases researchers there all the way through to electronic engineers. And the work I'm presenting today is of course a conglomerate of all of that. Within our group, we have an eclectic taste, but it really follows three main research themes. First of all, to track infectious diseases epidemiology and pertinent to today's talk, specifically antimicrobial resistance, and, and, and how it's changing. Then we try and do something about it. They're using two different technological means. So we are specifically looking at rapid diagnostics and how to insert those into the patient pathway to improve care. And then we're also thinking about artificial intelligence, machine learning to help us use the data we get from our laboratory, from our diagnostic results to more effect. And then our third stream is specifically around how we are using antimicrobials themselves, be they antibacterials, antivirals, antifungals, and to try and make that ever more safer and to make it more rational in the way that we use it so that we pay down the generations and antimicrobial resistance will grow at a slower rate. So I'm going to take you through those three different themes and the different work we do on it. It's data light, this talk, and narrative heavy. So uh, do dip into the references if you wish more detail, but I want to keep the flow going. And I guess the flow starts with trying to ascertain what the problem is, the size of the problem and how it changes. And we've been doing this for a decade now. And actually our mechanisms to extract data from our clinical data warehouses have reaped benefits over the last 10, 10 years or so. So we've developed systems where we can look at tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of different bacteria, and to look at the way the antimicrobial resistance changes in our patients across a huge swathe of London. We can follow this out to fungi and look at how it's impacting our, our fungi in our patients who have structural lung disease, who, ha who have immunocompromised conditions. And, and between those data rich sets, uh, looking at bacteria and fungi in our patients. Of course, once you know what the problem is, that feeds forward into how we construct our antimicrobial and antifungal policies to help patients in our sector. We also get little snippets of, of how what we do is revealing new generalizable, externalizable data. And when we dip into very specific cohorts here, as an example, is our eye infections, bearing in mind, of course, they are Patch is one of London's quaternary eye hospitals, we can see how actually we can discover new things about seasonality between the different bacterial uh, pathogens infecting our patient cohorts. And again, that feeds forward into us being able to optimize the care going forwards. Then separate to that data acquisition and churning out the where are we now, how are things changing? These data sets can also feed forward in to modeling and we can model where antimicrobial resistance is actually being generated most thereby targeting our interventions we can also use this data to forecast the future about where antimicrobial resistance and here is an example about some of the most difficult to treat pathogens those that are resistant to almost all antimicrobials we can forecast which patient cohorts they're going to affect in the coming 6 12 18 months thereby again enacting interventions and these robust data repositories have actually paid dividends again as we have tried to shuffle through the COVID pandemic, as have we all. And actually, the COVID pandemic, albeit a virus, has had profound impacts upon our bacteriology. 
and the kinds of bacterial infections we see in our patients. And in particular, we were one of the first groups to notice that our E. coli, now E. coli are gut pathogens, they are one of the commonest causes for sepsis. Uh, in patients presenting to secondary care organizations, we were one of the first groups to find that these were profoundly dipped during the first wave of the pandemic. And our data was replicated by French groups and US groups. And we've had further insights into why that may have occurred in 2020. Then separate to understanding the spread, what we've been able to do is really dig down into what is driving antimicrobial resistance. Why are we having this problem? And I was lucky enough to be involved in a multinational, multi-professional uh, think tank group at Chatham House a few years ago, where we tried to really pin down of all of the different ways in which we as a global, global citizens use antimicrobials, what is the biggest contributor, what are the biggest drivers, and what proportion of the population does it affect? And once we know that, once we understand the, the, the variation, the different contributory factors of these of these different aspects, we can then start to do something about it. And we were some of the first people to be pushing the agenda to the pharmaceutical agencies, to the commissioners, to the Department of Health globally, that perhaps we should de-link volume of antimicrobials to their price to healthcare providers. Fast forward, of course, to 2022, and over the last few weeks, you've seen that NICE here in the UK is now entering into this experiment, seven years on from from the great and the wise in that think tank saying it might be a good idea. So as we move forward through 2022, let's see how that evolves. We've also been able to focus on the drives of changing antimicrobial prescribing practice in light of COVID itself. And when we first reviewed what proportion of patients with coronaviruses went on to have true bacterial infections, we find it's one in 10. When we look at our actual data, data across the West London sector, we can see that it's even less than that. Perhaps less than 5% have confirmed bacterial infections along with their COVID. Yet when we and the world look at our prescribing practice, we see 60, 70, 80% of patients with COVID are getting antibacterials. And of course, that's then having a knock-on effect on antimicrobial resistance. And it's not just bacteria. We have been uh, working with colleagues throughout uh, Europe to look at secondary fungal infections amongst COVID patients, again, feeding forward into how we manage these critically unwell patients. And as we sit here now in July 2022, facing perhaps, perhaps another fruity wave, then actually these data that we have generated looking at secondary bacterial and secondary fungal infections amongst these virus infected patients, again, allow us to manage them better. But of course, the COVID pandemic has impacted our ability to enact antimicrobial stewardship in other ways too. And when we systematically reviewed this, we find four main themes arising. The first is the profound changes in our delivery of healthcare and the processes and infrastructure we have in all of our secondary care organizations around delivery of care. And that loss of institutional memory around how, how, how antimicrobial resistance resistance is bad and how antimicrobial stewardship uh, endeavors are good has been lost and that provides us with a key motivation and, and uh, practical ways in which antimicrobial stewardship teams can get back on that bandwagon however antimicrobial stewardship teams are infectious diseases doctors and of course we are a small group and so in fact we have been repurposed to frontline covid activities again contribute to a loss of antimicrobial stewardship agenda metrics. This has been compounded by a whole healthcare move, slowly in some areas, faster in others, towards provision of telemedicine. And of course, telemedicine is efficient. It minimizes healthcare transmitted infections, but actually it can, if we're not careful, inhibit the ability to pursue diagnostic tests on our patients when they're at the end of a computer screen, therefore minimizing our ability to detect antimicrobial resistance and therefore prescribe appropriately. And finally, what, we, what I alluded to earlier is that we have seen profound shifts often upwards of antimicrobial prescription as a direct result of patients being unable to distinguish viral pneumonitis from secondary bacterial infections. And that has really clobbered our antimicrobial stewardship agenda. But there is hope. There is hope because we have tools. And this is something that we have been pursuing for a long time. 
we, our research group, our Cinder research group, are particularly keen on near patient molecular diagnostics. After the early thousands and, and 20 teens, where we saw consolidation of laboratory practices and the centralization of, of diagnostic equipment, which brought around economies of scale, improved skill sets, what has actually happened over the last five, 10 years or so is a miniaturization of diagnostics, is a black box movement of diagnostics, which means that they can move from centralized hubs back towards our spoke sites, back towards our patients and be placed in ICUs, be placed in emergency departments, um, and actually really speed up that time to diagnosis for patients with bacterial infections, which may or may not be drug resistant bacterial infections. However, these come at a cost. And what we've also been able to do in our, re in our CINDA research group is actually look at the economic consequences of such diagnostic changes. Here, we've got an example which we pursued a couple of years ago, looking at uh, broad spectrum molecular diagnostics for patients with deep seated infections, looking at 600 odd patients and the cost to obtain a positive result comes out at three to 500 pounds to, to diagnose a patient with a deep-seated infection. But actually, when you, when you look at whether that helps us direct therapy, suddenly you have a log fold in the cost of these diagnostics, up towards one and a half thousand, sometimes up towards 4,000 pounds in terms of a diagnostic test to affect a prescription change for these patients with invasive bacterial infections. So what our translational group at Chelsea managed to do is to take these systems, not just look at their validation and verification test performance characteristics, but actually look at to where they insert into the patient pathway and the potential costs that has for our healthcare provision. And this reaped benefits again, as we waded into the COVID pandemic, where we could think about repurposing these molecular tools and working closely with our Imperial College London collaborators to think about how to better use near patient molecular diagnostics. In particular, we worked closely with DNA Nudge, a spin out of Imperial College led by Chris Tomazu's group, who had a miniaturized near patient diagnostic kit, which allowed us to diagnose patients with COVID very quickly. And as I mentioned earlier, when we can diagnose patients with COVID, Hopefully, we can avoid antibacterial prescriptions, therefore avoiding antibacterial use. And we, we were part of the initial broad group that verified that equipment, and then we led on movement of the uh, DNA nudge to not just diagnose one individual patient, but instead diagnose groups or bubbles of patients quickly and economically efficiently. Separate to molecular diagnostics, we've also developed a, a penchant really in at Chelsea for lateral flow diagnostics because they are cheap, because they can be effective and because they can provide near patient rapid information to distinguish a variety of different diagnoses. We work closely with the REACT2 Imperial College group to look at their lateral flow test for zero surveillance, which is of course part of our national program and is fed into our national data acquisition about where we are up to in the United Kingdom with COVID. But separately to that at Chelsea and Westminster, we've also undertaken really quite large zero surveillance studies of our workforce, looking at our change in zero positivity amongst our frontline staff delivering care to our COVID patients. And we've also then been able to use that large data set to correlate back how, how quantitative laboratory serology for COVID correlates through into near patient cheap lateral flow serology for patients. Now that provides a paradigm for us to then think about how to enact cheap near patient lateral flow diagnostics to help with antiviral therapy, to help with antiviral monoclonal antibodies in a near patient rapid way. And when we took that forward, we pursued two work streams, one around serology lateral flow tests and one around antigen lateral flow tests. And we verified various different bits of kit. And that's lovely. But actually, that's been able to generate externalizable, generalizable data around variations in zero conversion for different cohorts. And because at Chelsea, we work closely with the Royal Hospital Chelsea, who have a particularly uh, 
advanced age group population, we've been able to really find nuanced data around changes in COVID immunological responses at the extremes of age. And this again feeds forward into the way that we can help optimize antivirals, antiviral monoclonal antibodies, and other antimicrobial therapy for patients who have secondary infections uh, from COVID. The other tool we have is not just diagnostics, but is artificial intelligence. And those of you who know uh, my work before will have, will have understood understood that really I've spent the last 10 or 15 years thinking about artificial intelligence to optimize pathways for antimicrobial prescribing. Really Tim Rawson has taken on this mantle now and has actually reached uh, rollout stages and this was one of his manuscripts from last year that got into, uh, into CID where we are pulling real-time data from our clinical data repositories from biochemistry, hematology, radiology, microbiology, physiology from the real-time critical care pathways and encapsulating that into a patient vignette, comparing that using machine learning to historical data sets totaling thousands of patients and coming up with preferential optimal antimicrobial regimes for those patients. We at Chelsea have taken that one step further and use that not just for patient derived out outcomes, but actually use it as a stewardship tool. And what we've seen as we rolled out a decision support system for stewardship is that we can focus not just on stopping antibiotics, which is a old school antimicrobial stewardship, but actually on optimizing antibiotics microbial patients, which sometimes means increasing spectrum activity, sometimes means increasing doses, increasing and prolonging uh, duration. So actually, we have, we have experience across the spectrum of diet decision support systems rolling out at Chelsea, along with the Academic Health Sciences Centre partners. And we reflexed again, uh, you can detect a recurring theme here. We reflex this uh, experience in decision support systems and artificial neural networks into our approach to COVID. And using our, uh, our collaborators across Imperial College London with artificial neural net expertise, we developed uh, artificial intelligence systems to prognosticate for our patients coming with COVID. And across a sequence of manuscripts, perfected this, optimized this, and delivered this using an optimized graphical user interface on mobile phones for our clinical care users. And then the final stream, just for the last two minutes, is, is how we have been trying to optimize safety and rationality of our antimicrobial prescriptions. And Stephen Hughes, our consultant antimicrobial pharmacist, has been leading on this work stream with me. And he's looked at, we have looked at various different things. First of all, in our prescribing for our inpatients, separating antimicrobials from all of the nutritional supplements we give with good intent for our patients, but which can interfere with the pharmacokinetics of our antimicrobials, meaning that they are less effective. And simple prescription chart uh, interventions there can really impact the pharmacokinetics of our drugs. Separately, we've looked at the dangers that can be inherent in our antimicrobials if they're not handled safely by people who can understand and anticipate these dangers. These dangers include hyperkalemia and kidney injury. And actually through through looking at this, what we've managed to do is slipstream and optimize our prescription of some of the most kidney toxic antimicrobials to really mean that our patients can have the same antibacterial activity, but with reduced kidney impact. You may have noticed in our Cinder group, we have HIV experts. And really, as we have now waded into improving the safety of antimicrobials using that word in its widest form, the expertise of our HIV colleagues, Rachel Jones, Mike Raymond, to be able to nuance the way in which we prescribe antivirals has really come to the fore as we manage the antivirals for COVID. And actually some of our expertise and, and helpful hints for this has helped optimize the way in which these are used for our patients. Then in terms of rationalizing our antimicrobials, we have one of the largest outpatient ambulatory care units in the country across our Chelsea and Westminster Trust 2 sites. And what we've managed to do here is improve the safety and patient satisfaction of the antimicrobials we deliver to patients who are in the community 
yet need intravenous antimicrobials, making sure that our treatment of intra-abdominal infections, of skin-to-skin -skin structure infections, of urine and chest infections are optimized, meaning that patients have safer journeys, have the correct amount of antimicrobials without inadvertently poisoning them, and actually can affect cure as, as effectively as an inpatient stay, but without needing to fill up an inpatient bed. And the final thing, just before, uh, before I divert and devolve to Roger, is that uh, we, we get on our high horse frequently about shorter courses in an, of antimicrobials as a whole discipline. And actually at Chelsea, we've been able to uh, really focus on this and ensure that shorter courses can be personalized to our patients and can, uh, and can be safe. So with that, I will end. Other than say, I work across a huge group of people within our Cinder research group and wider, and I thank all of them. Thank you very much.